Hey friends, all across the internet, people are in an uproar about Ableton 11. It feels like you're not allowed to be neutral about this. You either need to be super stoked about all the new things, or you're supposed to be ultra mad about the fact that the update isn't free like logic. I'd like to offer what I hope is a peaceful respite from the endless barrage of rhetorical absolutism and da elitism, and simply just discuss whether or not Ableton 11 is worth updating for you and what you do. And I think the best way to do this is to go over the new features in Ableton 11, but instead of showing them off, let's look at how you might end up using them in the real world so you can see if it's worth it for you. So the first thing is comping. I already posted a video showing the new comping feature in Ableton 11. Comping is just the act of looping a section, recording audio or MIDI, and then being able to select snippets of each take to form one perfect take out of all of them. So for someone like me who's been producing music with a live band for 15 years with Ableton, this is a godsend and something I've been harping on in the Ableton forums for almost a decade. So you might think that this feature only matters for instrument players. I see this comment more than any other one. Why should I have to pay for comping? I don't even need that. First of all, you don't have to pay for anything. Secondly, anyone who thinks comping is just something for live musicians isn't seeing the big picture. I guarantee you that next year you're going to see a whole new workflow emerge from the EDM, IDM, glitchy producer scene where you set up comping from a track output that contains glitchy plugins like granulator, stutter edit, glitch machines, fracture, and so on, chopping and mangling stuff into multiple takes, then editing those takes back into your productions. Make no mistake, this is going to revolutionize those genres. Now, at some point I'll make a video about that, but I'm going to wait until you actually have able to 11 before I do that. So yeah, it's not just for instrument musicians. Now, when it comes to comping, the immediate rhetoric that you hear from other DAW users is, well, my DAW's had this feature for years, and to be fair, Ableton is shamefully late at the comping game, but consider for a second Ableton's unique warping algorithms. Some of them, especially the texture algorithm, is the basis for many electronic producers' unique sound. I can imagine that the elastic audio warping feature in Ableton was a bit more difficult to implement into the comping workflow than it was in other DAWs. Also, Ableton rolled comping out with the ability to link tracks together, so they did it right from the very beginning. So if you have a multi-mic setup with a drummer, for example, you can create linked track takes, which makes getting the drums right a lot easier and a lot faster. So anyone who's being reasonable and knows what it's like to endlessly edit drum hits can see how powerful this is, especially when you combine this with the warping algorithms. Okay, next, MPE. For those of you that don't know what this is, it doesn't stand for maximum permissible exposure, as in your laptop will still melt down if the aliens come correct with laser beams. But what it does stand for is MIDI polyphonic expression, which, yes, means that instruments with poly aftertouch are more expressive. But what you might not know is that it also means that parameters can change on a per-note basis via the new note expression view. This opens so many new creative doors. Think about a chord that shifts into another chord where each note bends up or down into the new one. That's only one of 1,000 ways you could take this. And Ableton's push is MPE ready, which I didn't even know until I got the beta. It's crazy. Now, another thing that it seems to be hard for people to understand is that you don't need anything instrument-wise that supports MPE to actually use MPE. It's now part of the piano roll. I think that this whole MPE thing is going to be really huge. Okay, the new devices. The new devices are pretty rad. The spectral stuff is nice, and the new doubler is really good, actually. But the new reverb is an absolute boss. Ableton's original reverb was never really a standout effect for me. But the new reverb is amazing. It does all the sweet algorithmic things that pedal reverbs do, like Big Sky and Empress, Ventress, Black Hole, etc. But it also brings convolution to the table, and it sounds really good. Honestly, it's amazing. Before I had this new verb, I would instantly go to Valhalla, my UAD verbs, Pro R, Altiverb, Convolution for Max for Live, but now I'm all hybrid reverb. But does that mean that you're going to be left in the dust if you don't get this reverb? Unless you count the fact that you can import any sound into the convolution part and use that as an IR, which opens up a whole weird new world of sound design, there really isn't anything new here other than that this reverb brings all the verbs available in the world together into one device. I really do have to admit that this verb is likely going to kill my need for much of my other reverb plugins because it can cover so much sonic ground. But yeah, 90% of what this reverb is capable of can be created with other devices available already in the world. And this brings me to one of the big points I want to make. You got to be careful out there. Many of us have a bad case of gas or gear acquisition syndrome. We always want the latest and greatest things. The idea we use to justify this is that if I get this new gear, then I'll be a better musician. Or if I get this gear, I'll have a better chance at breaking through and making it. But consider this, Aphex Twin created one of my favorite electronic songs of all time, the Bucephalus Bouncing Ball, which is likely named after Alexander the Great's horse's balls. 
Which is hilarious, but if you've never listened to this tune with headphones on in a dark room in an enhanced state, you're in for a treat. But anyway, Mr. James created this IDM masterpiece of a tune with what we would consider primitive gear in 1997. And that's along with all the other insane music the guy made before that. I'm bringing this up because while I think it's amazing to be surrounded by all this G-Wiz tech, yo, you can do amazing things with any version of Ableton. So don't think that if you can't afford to upgrade right now that you're going to be left in the dust. That's just not true. Now moving on to stage musician improvements, I don't want to diminish how incredible this new version 11 is going to be for live musicians. The tempo following, the scene follow actions, the new 16 macros and racks, this is going to be a game changer for me specifically. Before now, I had to program each and all of my clips to play in follow actions for live shows, or I had to manually launch the next scene for each new part in my band. It was super tedious, and this is going to totally revolutionize that. But yo, the new 16 macros is going to be huge for studio musicians. Let me explain. You can now randomize parameters. Imagine starting up a sound design session when you're looking to create a bunch of new material. Randomizers are so useful, and when all else fails, they can be really inspiring. Imagine having a vocal that you want to glitch up. Just slap a beat repeat in there, followed by whatever else, and map all 16 controls to the macros and scramble away. This is also, and again, mark my words, this is going to be a common production technique in 2021. So again, these new features, though marketed toward live musicians, are going to be very useful in the studio. CPU monitoring. Now this may seem gimmicky to you, but I don't know how many times I've loaded up a project and been right at the roof of what my computer can handle, and I need to do just one more little thing to the track. And I don't want to take the time to freeze a bunch of tracks if I only knew which track was the culprit of my CPU woes. Oh snap, it's this a-hole! This has already saved me multiple times and I've only been using Ableton 11 for about a month. So yeah, there's more to go over, but at this point I'm sure you've heard enough about Ableton 11 and you'd rather just get back to making music, which is what you should be doing anyway. And by the way, I wanted to mention that I finally launched my Ableton courses. If you're into Ableton production and you want to learn more, here's a free webinar with some awesome tips on how to make better music and where you can get a taste of what my full courses are like. The link will also be in the description and comments, so if you like my teaching style, check that out. Anyway, like, comment, subscribe, and thanks for watching, everybody. I'll see you next time.